okay? Uh, there's a widespread perception common to non-believers and believers alike that atheism and science are in some way intrinsically linked. Strictly speaking, this is by no means inevitable. An absence of belief in the existence of God or gods in itself implies nothing whatsoever about science and is perfectly compatible with all manner of beliefs and opinions in this general area. For instance, there is nothing to stop an atheist, quite atheist, from believing in angels, sprites, ghosts, or leprechauns, or that the earth is flat, or that fossils and the moon landing are part of a vast government conspiracy. That said, this perceived connection is undoubtedly a real one. A great many atheists cite science, either in general or some specific finding or theory, as one of the main justifications for their position, and unbelief is frequently accompanied by a naturalistic and or materialistic worldview of one sort or another. Some atheists would go so far as to claim that, at root, being properly scientific and being properly religious are incompatible. A conviction that might manifest itself in assertions that eminent scientists who claim to hold theological beliefs cannot really do so. Views this strong, however, are relatively uncommon. In general, however, there is a widespread view that, at best, science and religion make uneasy bedfellows, and that even if science doesn't necessarily demand positive atheism, modern science has seriously undermined whatever plausibility religious worldviews of whatever kind might once have had in less enlightened times. Given the significance of this kind of belief and its taken-for-granted status, including among many Christians, it will be worth our making a few brief comments here. This is, however, neither the time nor the place for a detailed rundown of the relationship between religion, in inverted commas, and science, in inverted commas, not least because there is no single coherent thing that either of those nouns picks out. Both refer, in very general terms, to amorphous and diffuse, millennia-old spheres of human interest and activity, success and failure, and enlightenment and obfuscation. Even confining oneself to the modern Western post-Renaissance scientific tradition on the one hand and mainstream European Christianity on the other, one is dealing with a huge and tangled web of concords, conflicts and contradictions. One is therefore well advised to be wary of any too easy generalizations. It is true enough that the churches have, on occasion, condemned not just certain scientific theories, but also those who have pro pr proposed or propagated them and that they have sometimes done so in an intensely regrettable way. Certain names spring immediately to mind in this connection, for example, Galileo. And while the actual history is inevitably more complex than the later caricatures, these are scarcely among the more glorious chapters in the history of Christianity. Nevertheless, it remains difficult to read out of any of these any Christian animus against science in general. In almost all such cases, what one is witnessing is the church expressing its support, however ill-advisedly, in favour of one scientific theory or group of scientists against a different theory and or group. Thus, while it is easy enough in retrospect to lambast Pope Urban VIII for reprimanding Galileo, it is convenient to forget that the genius scientist's sun-centred model of the cosmos was opposed by the overwhelming consensus of other scientists too. Something similar is true of another celebrated moment in the science versus religion conflict, all in inverted commas, of course. Christopher Columbus's failure to convince the scholars assembled at Salamanca to support his bid to sail westwards to the Indies. This is a, a very famous picture. Uh, it's noteworthy the date that it was painted. Um, and it's also noteworthy to see the, the tall, standing proud Columbus, the man of science, surrounded by angry-looking and crusaders several years late, uh, ecclesiastic figures. This is Columbus using science, pointing at a map to show that the world is spherical, and an inquisitor pointing at the Bible to show that it can't be. popular myth locates the disagreement in Columbus maintaining in the alleged face of religious ignorance that the earth was round, this is not so. In fact, no scholar seriously doubted the earth's sphericity, nor had they with just one or two very minor exceptions throughout the whole course of Christian history. 
The cleric scholars of Salamanca did, though, affirm the established mainstream scientific opinion that it was a sphere of roughly twice the size that Columbus supposed. As such, they doubted that his ships could carry sufficient supplies to get them as far as the Indies. And this time, unlike in the Galileo affair, the church, albeit in this case an unofficial panel of priests and scholars, was absolutely right. Had Columbus not chanced upon the Americas, although he himself never realized quite what he had discovered, then the Nina, the Santa Maria, and the Pinta would never have been seen again. More recently, the allegation of an all-out open warfare between science and Christianity, without denying the existence of or damage done by certain skirmishes of various import, should be at the very least complicated by three, four further facts. Nicholas Steno, the 17th century Danish founding father of modern geology, was not only the titular bishop of Titiopolis, but was beatified in 1988. Gregor Mendel, who's been mentioned before today, the 19th century discoverer of genetics, and thus the supplier of a vital missing piece in Darwin's theory, was an Augustinian friar. No less than 35 of the moon's craters are named in honor of Jesuit scientists and mathematicians, that's one of them, and his crater. And the Big Bang Theory of the Universe's beginning was first theorized, as you know, and as you've heard already today several times, by the Belgian priest and eminent cosmologist Georges Lemaitre in 1931. Structured around these four claims, one might construct a history of how the Catholic Church has been the prime mover of modern scientific discovery. One would, however, be foolish to do so. Not because any of these statements is false, they're not, but because such cherry-picking cannot hope to represent a remotely accurate picture of so large, complex, and contentious a topic as the one in question. The same is true of any parallel attempt to do the opposite on the basis of the Galileo affair, or a made-up retelling of Columbus at Salamanca. Yet overblown point-scoring claims from either side must not distract us from the crucial significance that modern scientific discoveries, especially some of those in the fields of physics and biology, hold for Christian theology. Famously, Sigmund Freud once cited Copernicus and Darwin as initiating the first two great but humbling revolutions in human thought, the first displacing the earth as the center of the earth, the second relegating humanity to just another animal species. While one may not agree with Freud's assessment, he is certainly correct in affirming the import of these discoveries. And it is largely upon these that the prevalent view that science had eroded the plausibility of Christianity, or religion in general, is founded. Of the two, in fact, it is the Darwinian revolution that almost certainly is the most troubling for Christianity. Modern astrophysics, ultimately flowing from the Copernican revolution, is actually, as we've seen, a rather fertile ground for Christian metaphysical speculation and argumentation. For instance, the Big Bang cosmological model, which predicts a near instantaneous beginning of the universe at some definite point in the remote past, suffered in its early decades from the suspicion that it was simply a front for the Christian doctrine of creation out of nothing. Furthermore, the apparently fine-tuned nature of the universe, such that a minuscule difference in the strength of one of several fundamental physical laws would have rendered the development of life, and indeed much of a universe at all, impossible, appears to some to betray the hand of a creator with an interest in providing the necessary conditions for life to develop. The trouble in going last in a day like this is that you hear your whole paper kind of... <laughs> piecemeal in all the papers leading up to it. It's quite a good summative thing. This. By contrast, Darwin is like a sort of a highlight of the day, the sort of match of the day. By contrast, Darwin's theory of natural selection and thus the overwhelming obser and, and the overwhelming observational confirmation it has received since first proposed over 150 years ago poses significant prima facie challenges to Christianity. Most obviously, it explains the manifold complexity and diversity in the biological world as the product of the gradual accumulation and refinement of inherited characteristics, in place of explaining each instance as a special creation of God. In itself, and contrary to popular belief, that is not so great a problem for traditional Christian theology as one might assume. There is a long history in the Christian tradition of interpreting Genesis 1 to 3, as we've already heard, as though it isn't intended as a scientific textbook. St. Augustine's literal interpretation of Genesis being, contrary to the impression its title might give, a case in point. And even within a few years of the origin of species' original publication, 
So conservative a theologian as John Henry Newman expressed few qualms at the thought of going the whole hog with Darwin. What Darwin's theory did do, however, was overcome an obvious flaw in pre-Darwinian pre naturalistic worldviews. Richard Dawkins puts it well, and he's right to identify it as a watershed moment in the intuitive plausibility of unbelief. An atheist before Hume could have said, an atheist before Darwin, rather, could have said, following Hume, I have no explanation for complex biological design. All I know is that God isn't a good explanation, so we must wait and hope that somebody comes up with a better one. I can't help feeling that such a position, though logically sound, would have left one feeling pretty unsatisfied. And that although atheism might have been logically tenable before Darwin, Darwin made it possible to be an intellectually fulfilled atheist. Much more problematic for Christian theology considered in itself, however, are the challenges that this view of life, as Darwin referred to his theory, poses to a number of core Christian doctrines, not least the four, original sin and providence. The American theologian John Hort is right to note that in the wake of Darwin, Christian theologians have generally been slow to integrate into their theologies the four billion year evolutionary story of life struggling, striving and suffering. Neither Hort nor I, in fact, believe that the challenges posed by Darwin are insuperable to orthodox Christian theology. Nevertheless, he cites the fact that many theologians, while formally accepting Darwin, continue nonchalantly to write and think about humanity, sin and salvation, without feeling the need to grapple with these issues explicitly. This, Hort suggests, gives the impression that there is, after all, an impassable gulf between modern scientific knowledge and the Christian faith such that, for many educated people, therefore, embracing Christian faith still seems to require an ignoring, if not suppression, of some of the most important truths that they have learnt from the natural sciences. And if this is true of people who do, nevertheless, see enough of what is true in Christianity to want to subscribe to it, how much more must it reinforce the impressions of others that even if there is not, after all, a necessary conflict between science and religion, there nevertheless is between Darwin and Orthodox Christianity. As the intellectual reasons to disbelieve go, then this is surely one that requires a great deal more thought on the part of believers. This is the second half. And again, we've had all this before. In a remarkable passage in, as previously mentioned, St. Augustine's notably unliteral, literal interpretation of Genesis, he urges his fellow believers against making rash, Bible-based pronouncements on scientific topics. Augustine points out that a great many non-Christians are very well informed on subjects such as astronomy, zoology, botany, and geology, and that they regard their knowledge of these matters to be certain from reason and experience. As such, it is a disgraceful and dangerous thing for an unbeliever to hear a Christian, presumably giving the meaning of Holy Scripture, talking nonsense on these topics. And we should take, by all, take all means to prevent such an embarrassing situation in which people show up a Christian's vast ignorance and lift, laugh it to scorn. Augustine's point is that such non-Christians, on hearing such misguided views attributed to the scriptures, will come to dismiss and deride Christianity itself. He adds pointedly, if they find a Christian mistaken in a field which they themselves know well, and hear him maintaining his foolish opinions about our books, how are they going to believe those books in matters concerning the resurrection of the dead, the hope of eternal life, and the kingdom of heaven, when they think their pages are full of falsehoods on facts which they themselves have learnt from experience and the light of reason? Augustine proceeds to lambast these reckless and incompetent expounders of Holy Scripture, who, in order to defend their utterly foolish and obviously untrue statements, cite memorized biblical proof texts, which they think support their position, despite the fact that, and here he quotes 1 Timothy 1.7, they don't understand either what they are saying or things about which they are making assertions. Several centuries later, writing in the second book of his commentary on Peter Lombard's sentences, Thomas Aquinas heeds Augustine's warning. Adjudicating between differing interpretations of Genesis 1, each championed by learned and saintly commentators, 
Thomas errs against the commoner and seemingly more literal one, primarily on the grounds that the other better protects scripture from, in his phrase, the mockery of unbelievers, irisio infidelium. As an aside, Thomas's precise point that he's wrestling with relates to the question of whether, in the beginning, God created all things simultaneously or in a number of successive stages, as the Genesis with its kind of day-by-day -day narration implies. Perhaps surprisingly, this is the former position, the instantaneous creation, that Thomas admits is more pleasing to me for the reasons already given, because it better protects scripture from the mockery of unbelievers. However, heeding also Augustine's cautions against siding too strongly with a single interpretation of a scriptural text that can legitimately support several, lest if further progress in search of truth undermines this position, we too fall with it, Thomas lays aside his own stated preference in order to present the argument for both sides. Thomas's reasoning here, avoiding the mockery of unbelievers as a basis for theological and exegetical judgments, might strike us as strange, at least if it is understood as a purely apologetic decision, i.e. springing from a desire to present Christian doctrine in the most enticing possible light in order to lure in suspecting outsiders. This is not, however, Thomas's point at all. Instead, like Augustine, he acknowledges the wisdom and knowledge that many unbelievers have on certain scientific and philosophical matters. Hence, provided that no essential point of the Christian faith is at issue, a point to which we shall return, if a particular interpretation of scripture is likely to give rise to such mockery, then that is in itself a decent indication that it might well not be the correct one. Augustine and Thomas raise an important point and one that applies far more widely than the correct interpretation of Genesis, though this is, of course, still an important area today, perhaps more so now than it was in their times. It is a very commonly heard complaint that such and such an atheist writer is merely dismantling straw men, critiquing old man in the sky caricatures, tilting at theological windmills, that the God whom Friedrich Nietzsche or Bertrand Russell doesn't believe in isn't the same one that Christians do. Many of these criticisms are no doubt true enough. Those pointed out uh, elsewhere, in chapter one it says here, but it doesn't follow that all such criticisms must be. But we come back once again to the question of who precisely is to blame for this. If Christian theology is so susceptible to cartoonish misrepresentations, and if Christians themselves have gained a reputation, however false, for being irrational, childishly wishful thinkers, then this has certainly not arisen out of nothing. At least some of the windmills tilted up, perhaps, are ones that believers themselves have had a hand in constructing. After all, it doesn't take a Herculean effort of intellectual empathy to see why an unbeliever might, wrongly, think that Christians extol faith as being blind trust in the absence of evidence, even in the teeth of evidence, Dawkins, or might, wrongly, view the doctrine of the atonement as a vicious, sadomasochistic, and barking mad idea, Dawkins again, or might, wrongly, regard St. Anselm's ontological argument to be infantile and best suited to the language of the playground, Dawkins yet again. Note that these are all quotations from a person brought up in a Christian country who was baptised and who spent his formative years at a Christian school. A Gaudium at Spes 19, Vatican II identified Christians neglecting education in the faith and teaching false doctrine as factors in the prevalence of atheism. Either one might easily lead to engendering the justified mockery of unbelievers, mockery which, as Augustine stresses, is mistakenly directed at Christianity itself. Yet Augustine is perhaps overly harsh to his reckless and incompetent expounders of Holy Scripture. For it is indeed a difficult and daunting task to understand, expound, and explain authentic Christian teaching on the vast range of topics that people might ask about, and in a manner that does justice to what one is hoping faithfully to represent. Fear of exciting the Arisio infidelium, the mockery of unbelievers, must moreover surely be tempered by fidelity to the injunction in 1 Peter 3.15. Always be ready to make your defense to anyone who demands from you an account of the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and reverence. The middle ground here, presumably, is for believers to make a real effort 
to learn more about the faith which they profess, to seek out trustworthy teachers and writers, and to strive to understand better why it is that Christianity affirms certain things, especially those which might, at first sight, seem to be obviously false, obviously repellent, or obviously both. And furthermore, that they do so not only for their own sakes, but for the sakes of, in Augustine's phrase, people outside the household of faith for whose salvation we toil. Indeed, to paraphrase Henri de Lubac, if so many people are so grievously mistaken about the essence of Christianity, is it not an indication that Christians should make an effort to understand it better themselves? The issue of Aurecio Infidelium raises another equally important point. I mentioned above just how important it is for theologians properly to think through Christian doctrine in light of new scientific discoveries, with the Darwinian revolution and its myriad implications chief among them. And indeed, the above quoted passages from Augustine could just as easily have been written word for word in the present day. Those even passingly acquainted with modern biology can and do find much to mock in many Christians' assertions regarding the meaning of Genesis 1. In contexts such as these, our two great saints do well to counsel contemporary believers against needlessly scandalizing outsiders and thus prejudicing them against Christianity. Avoiding the mockery of unbelievers is not, however, an absolute overriding norm for Christian theology. Thomas, in particular, is careful to distinguish between things pertaining to the substance of faith, such that God is through and one and the like, and other less essential beliefs upon which a greater latitude of opinion is possible. For Thomas, the affirmation that the world was created by God belongs to the former category, where are certain technical points about quite how it was brought about, matters on which even the saints disagree, explaining scripture in different ways, Thomas puts it, belong to the latter. For Thomas, if the very notion that God had created the heavens and the earth spurs unbelievers' mockery, then so much the worse for the unbelievers. But learned and well-informed unbelievers might well have valid opinions about some of the details about how quite, how, how quite this was brought about, and one must be careful not to scandalize them needlessly. He goes so far as to write that in these cases, scripture must be explained in such a way that the unbeliever cannot mock. Importantly though, what neither Thomas nor Augustine is here prescribing is a kind of carte blanche to modify or dilute the substance of faith to suit the whims of the day. Atheists' incredulity towards, say, the incarnation or resurrection or even the existence of God is not a legitimate ground for reinterpreting Christianity in any demythologized way. Authentic Christianity is indeed committed to certain claims that are and ought to be, at least at first sight, foolishness to Gentiles. The intellectual bodlerization of the gospel and all other such undoubtedly well-meaning attempts to domesticate the Christian message are just as much cases of teaching false doctrine as is, say, insisting that Christianity is necessarily committed to young earth creationism, which, if it was, would make heretics of Augustine and Thomas. To be sure, it may well be difficult to discern what is and is not essential to the substance of the faith. The dividing line between foolishness to Gentiles and mockery of unbelievers might well be a fine one. Even so, it is well to remember that there is more than one way to a gun quote Vatican II, rather more to conceal than reveal the authentic face of God and religion. Thank you.